maybe have people arrive and say, oh, I'm not paying to walk around a garden. And it's it's like having a dagger thrown at you, isn't it? As Alan will know if you've read my book, I'm really into thermal underwear. And the other day I put on my son's, um, what do they call it, a skin that you wear for rugby. <gasps> it's fantastic. There's a hilarious story about a euphorbia dickster. Christo gave them a piece and it was a really, really hot day, and they stopped apparently on the way home. They saw a puddle, stopped and got some water, put this thing in some mud to get it home. I mean, it's madness, but it's all quite fun. Hello and welcome to episode 24 of Talking Dirty over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, looking a little bit like Dennis the Menace in his red and black stripes, which is very apt, uh, is the very naughty Alan Edward Herbert Gray. Herbert, our happy and handsome horticulturalist. <laughs> and over in Cambridge, there is Thornis Maria Sophia Friedrichsen, ladies and gentlemen, looking absolutely fabulous in a rainbow stumped, striped even jumper, which I think is look, look, actually it's very cheery. We could have done with that at the weekend here because we had, you know, Beth Chateau used to say on a dull day, the sky is the colour of the inside of my dustbin lid. Well, we had two <laughs> dustbin lid days on Saturday and Sunday here. It really was horrid. Today, the sun is shining and you brought it out. Wonderful. Lovely. Well, I got the stripey memo, clearly. It's all about stripes today. Uh, joining us for the first time on the podcast, we're very excited, is another guest with a lot of, of hats, a lot of accolades. We have Matthew Wilson, who's not only an award-winning uh, garden and landscape designer, but of course a writer and a regular panellist on Gardener's Question Time on BBC Radio 4. How are you? Well, I'm fine, except I now feel completely inadequate in the face of your wonderfully extravagant middle names. I mean, what is going on? It's just not fair. You know what, my, my, I had, my maternal, paternal great-grandfather had the most wonderful name. You know, Matthew Wilson is quite a common name. If you Google Matthew Wilson, you come up with a ballet dancer, an Australian soap actor, a rally driver. I mean, there's a lot of, oh, the, the 2010 Canadian duck calling champion. He's Matthew Wilson. There's a lot of offers out there, to be honest. And I, I sometimes think, gosh, you know, what, what, you know, what's in a name? Well, actually, quite a lot. My great grandfather, who was a, a um, uh, started his life as a as a, a Northamptonshire farmer, and then made good and became a Savile Row tailor. Um, he had the most fabulous um, uh, first names. He was named after his grandmother and his mother mother's um, surnames. So his name, he's the only one who's ever lived, by the way, it was Barker Knight Wilson. Hey, Google him, and he is the only one who's ever lived. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> there's, quite ideas with me. there's quite a fashion today for boys' names to be, um, shall we say, sur surnames of yesteryear. Names like Harrison, for instance. I mean, he's now used as a Christian name. So he was mm. the forerunner of that, probably. Yes. Yeah, there we are. Yeah. No, I love it. Um, it's funny, though, with a name like Thordis, you'd think getting hold of my Twitter handle, etc. would have been easy. But despite the fact I was really early on joining Twitter, somebody had already taken Thordis. And to yeah, add yeah. insult to injury, they didn't even tweet. That's why I'm at Thunder Fairy, because this, this non-using mm. Twitter person had stolen my very rare name. So. Yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> Thordis, <laughs> it was me. <laughs> Yeah, now, now's your opportunity, Alan, to sell it back to her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for a huge sum. Yeah. I'm not that rich. Don't, don't make it too steep. Um, but just to put, um, in case anyone's excited that you're going to start playing the guitar for us, is the guitar oh, yeah. going to come off the wall behind you and are you going to play us a tune? Uh, probably not, no. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do, I do, I, you know, I, I've been, music has been my great passion all my life. Um, and I've always well, I was in bands all through my teens and twenties, and and uh, uh, and loved it, and, and came very quite close to getting a record deal at one point, and that didn't quite work out. And that's when I sort of, you know, had the wake up moment and said, right, come on, you know, you've got to actually, you know, realise that this isn't going to happen the way you hoped it might. Do something else, which is when I uh, ended up getting into what I do now. Um, but I am now back in. I'm in a dad band. With uh, with four other guys and we we play, uh, you know, hither and thither and uh, you know just do like fundraising gigs. So normally, the, the, one of the things I felt quite sad about in the this last most recent lockdown 
is that we'd ordinarily be doing like a fundraiser for Crisis at Christmas, which we've done every year. And, and actually, um, I, I don't know whether it's a consequence of the music that we play or, or, or enthusiasm on the part of the uh, people attending, but they all seem to drink quite a lot. Maybe they're trying to block something out. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so normally we raise quite a decent amount of money. Um, and, and I love it. I, you know, and I, I think an appreciation for music, um, you know, talking about Beth Chateau, mentioning Beth Chateau, one of the things that sticks in my mind about about her and, and, and you know, getting to know her well was her saying to me, you know, the best gardeners are people who are interested in music and art and literature and architecture and climate and colour and texture and all these different things, you know, because actually that's what makes you not just a more interesting person and a more rounded person, but you can then appreciate your garden through multiple different lenses because you've got all these other interests and it's so true you know i, I think um it's you know I, I, there are pl lots of plant obsessives out there and that's perfectly fine if that's your thing and i'm obsessed about some plants but i'm obsessed about other things as well like music and reading and that kind of stuff i've learned that it's easy to be obsessed with various things <laughs> Yes. If you've got Indeed. a lot of energy, then you can be obsessed with loads of different things. Yes. Do you listen to music, you know, in the potting shed or when you're designing or or is that a place where you need kind of clear brain space? Um, it depends. I probably would. I mean, I certainly listen to things like, um, I suppose, the more meditative end of the classical music scene. I love Gorecki and I listen to Gorecki quite a lot because I, I love the sort of, ebb and flow of of, um, of the strings, you know, that it's it's sort of very meditative. I can't I can't listen to anything that's too um, hectic, to because that just doesn't doesn't work for me. Although having said that, occasionally if I if I've had a you know a, a slightly unfortunate email exchange with a client or something, it doesn't happen very often. I might put some I don't know death metal on or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any death metal. I don't know why I said that. Um, but I, you know, I quite like I quite like the sort of mellower end of uh, of stuff when I'm working, um, uh, not too heavy on lyrics because that distracts me for some reason. I'll be doing a plant list and I'll start typing in the lyrics from a song instead of actually <laughs> concentrating on what I should be doing. When I've um, headed over to your potting shed, Alan, at East Ruston Old Vicarage, you seem to listen to a mix of classical music and maybe a bit of Radio Four, a bit of speech. Yeah, I do actually. I mean, I quite like. I mean, if I say it, it's, it's silly, but there's been one of my favourite programmes for years, and that's Woman's Hour, because it, it it just covers an immense range of topics. About your music, I mean, I must say the one thing I do like to listen to sometimes, if I need waking up and I need my stumps stirring, I go to Kachaturian, because, I mean, that the, those wonderful sort of, um, I don't know, it's got, it's, to me, it's not classical, it's just thumpy and bumpy it's a bit like heavy metal to lots of other people i guess <laughs> i just love it one of the, the nicest things about being able to um work in this the studio down here in, which is at the end of our garden that was some old stables is um i i managed to liberate all my old cds from storage and uh bought myself a cd player so i've got i've got about a thousand cds they're all on a long shelf all the way along one side of the, the and it's and it's lovely because you know, I, I've got the my vinyl is in in the house with a with a record player, and and um, I think the way that we now digest music, um, it, it's it's great. Streaming is great, although I'm not sure how good it is for the artists involved. But it, I, I feel that you don't necessarily concentrate in the way that the you know artists spend a lot of time thinking about the running order of an album, for example, and then we go and spoil that all by streaming it and and you know creating endless playlists that. Um, you know jump around all over the place which is cool but sometimes I think it's just really good to listen to a piece of music as the artist intended end to end and, and particularly with vinyl where of course in the middle of it you turn the record over that's a, that's a magical moment to me read the liner notes gosh you know all of that I mean that I mean it's that's also very much like um, a garden how you walk through a garden in a funny sort of way isn't it because yeah. you know who whether it's a designer that's designed the garden or whether they've designed it with the client, it is a, a procession. And you've thought yes. about, quite carefully thought about how it is, um, how it's going to unfold. Yes. And I suppose to take that uh, analogy to your own garden, 
Alan, I'm sure there's a way in which you would suggest to people this is the way in which you should enjoy the garden. Yeah, I do. I do to a certain extent. You're absolutely right. But then I do exactly the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> because I, well, I'll tell you why. Because we have quite a, um, a, a large following of season ticket holders. And um, I often say to them in the summer, when you next come to the garden, view it in reverse. Because if you go around, the, don't go the usual old route. Go, do it in reverse, because you'll see entirely different bits of the garden. You'll see the whole garden from a different angle anyway. Mm. And you'll suddenly think, oh, I didn't realise this was here or whatever. Um, and that's quite a fascinating thing to do as well. Um, yes. And if it works in reverse, it means you've done it, you've done it well, because it, mm. if it works the way you intend it to, and then it works in reverse. I mean, it, 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 it just works. The whole thing works. I think it's interesting, and I, I, I mean, my own our garden here in, in Rutland hasn't uh, hasn't yet broken cover and been photographed by anybody. But I'm, uh, plenty of the gardens I've designed have been. Of course, Alan, your garden's been photographed a lot. Mm. I think it's fascinating when a professional garden photographer shoots a garden that you've designed or your own garden because they see it totally differently. And yeah. I, I, I've had occasions where I've looked at photographs of, um, I just had uh, some photographs done recently by Richard Bloom of a, of a garden that I designed in Northumberland. He's, uh, he's got his star in the ascendancy, hasn't he? He has, he has. Um, very well. I mean, Richard came here, first of all, I think probably all 10 years ago, and he's been recently to do another article. I think Country Life are doing an article on the garden next year, and he's photographed that. But I mean, I'd, I've noticed his name suddenly becoming very prominent. Sorry, I yeah, he, Well, he's very good. I mean, he has a very, um, uh, beautiful approach to framing photographs, mm. as they all do. But I was looking at one, one particular set of these photographs and I was thinking, well, where on earth is that? Because he'd seen a, a vista that I just hadn't really realized was there. And now when I go back to that particular client's garden, I go and stand in that spot, oh, right, okay, now I see it. And I think that's really fascinating that people can enjoy and experience something that you have been involved in designing or have designed and they experience it in a different way. And, and, and uh, you learn more about your own work as a consequence, I think. I think you learn more about yourself as well. Probably, yeah. Yeah, I think you do. I yeah. should think this year has been uh, definitely a time for learning. We, there's been so much talk about more people getting into gardening, more people wanting that outside space to enjoy. Have you seen sort of people's designs or the kind of what they want out of their design have you seen that change this year have you had to adapt a bit um to your your clientele that's an interesting question i think that i i, I think probably the biggest change wouldn't be to a specific plant or group of plants but it would unquestionably be a, a more serious and a more focused approach from from the clients that I'm working with. I think they just suddenly think you know what this is isn't just about oh we you know we've done the house up now we should you know make the tart of the garden up it's a, it's a lot more serious than that generally speaking the people that I work with tend to be more serious about their gardens anyway definitely I would say it's very interesting mentioning the Northumberland project which has been a, a really wonderful project to be involved in over the last couple of years we're just on the sort of last stretch now um, we, I designed in this sort of potager kitchen garden. So very pretty, lots of cut flowers and lovely little Hartley botanic greenhouse and raised beds and whatever. And, and when it was first completed by the contractor, the client said, well, we're never going to fill that. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> and, and now they're scratching around saying, we need some more growing space. You know, and they just they filled it, you know, and, they, and they've loved, you know, eating from that garden. And it's, it's, it's been wonderful to see. And I, I'd actually planted, you know, two or three of the beds I, I planted with herbs as a sort of permanent planting, thinking, well, at least you won't be completely overwhelmed with bare earth. And they're now saying, actually, we'll, maybe we'll put the herbs somewhere else because we could do with the growing space. So I think that's beca definitely become a, a theme this year. And it's the same for us here, actually. We, we added two or three new raised beds to our little kitchen garden here. And starting in the new, in, it is a new year, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm, my, big, my big project uh, is to create a new kitchen garden. Well, it's a, more of a cutting garden, I suppose, really. It's, it's, uh, it will have some vegetables. So I suppose it's slightly pottager, but 
the emphasis is going to be more on on cut flowers because my my wife has really got into cutting um, this last year, and I think again that's something that perhaps is 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 a, you know more appealing, you know that having being able to take flowers into the house from the garden, um, you know the inability to buy cut flowers during the first lockdown would have been one of the drivers and indeed the second lockdown. So, you know, th I think there's, I think there's a lot of, perhaps it's more of a focus on what we can do at home in our own gardens to, to make our lives richer or easier or happier. And, you know, I, all of which out of a horrible, wretched, awful year, all of are tremendous positives, I think. I think the other thing is it's gone back to um, old fashioned cottage gardening in lots of ways, because um, my grandmother, um, Granny Gray, had the most wonderful garden that was just full of everything, produce and flowers and everything else. And one of the things we used to, I mean, all the flowers were grown either cut flowers, but grown mainly from seed. I mean, I think, think talking about things like Clarkia and Godetia um, and Gypsophila, which she used to grow from seed every year and anything else that was she had in the garden would be divided and they were grown in rows no nonsense there'll be a hoe going between the rows and that was it um, and all of those things and you know we used to take her and I on a Saturday afternoon we used to cut for these flowers on a Saturday morning take them to the church on Saturday afternoon and put them on family graves and things like that well you know we didn't go up and buy those flowers and the people as you say um, quite rightly they couldn't go out and buy flowers during the lockdown and you know you had to make do with what you had but it's so easy just to take a packet of seed and put a few cut flowers in I mean Clark is as one of my favorite plants for doing this with we grew Clark here here in the garden about 10 years ago for the first time and there was a whole generation of people that didn't know what it was because no old-fashioned you know and it'd been completely off their radar and it's rather charming in a way when they suddenly go oh, what's that we must have that. And they don't realize it is a very simple, um, you know, take the corner off a packet of seed and, and sow very thinly and there you are, job done. Yeah, yeah. And there's lots of those, um, you know, wonderful, easy to grow uh, annuals, easy to grow annuals. We, I, one of the things that I often say to uh, people who are, you know, planning on making new borders in a garden, but, are, are, you know, maybe the resources aren't there to plant them up in the first year or whatever, you know, go and buy some of these direct sown annuals. Victoria mm. Meadows is one of the, the companies that produces a lot of these different mixes, um, but there are others. And it's so easy and you can have instant color and you don't have to, to wait. And I've done this in a, we sort of work in progress at the front of our house. If you ask my wife, everything's work in progress. <laughs> it's, it's a great uh, fire. Anyway, um, and, uh, and I knew I wasn't going to get around to, to planting this quite large bed. So, I, you know, I just hit it with some Pictorial Meadows Aqua Mix, which was the same mix that they made for the around the Aquatic Centre at the London 2012 Olympics. It's absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, people yeah. walking along the uh, little lane where we live, you know, I mean, talk about curb appeal. There were people stopping and looking at it and talking about it. And it's wonderful. It was a lovely thing, I think, as well. If you did have, you know, my my front garden is right along the path and it's where most of the dog walkers go to then head out into the fens. And um, I had a lot of Shirley poppies and a lot of cornflowers. And it was really nice that the odd person would say, oh, could, I, could I take a seed pod and try it in my garden? I said, well, I've got quite a lot, so please help yourself. And I love the idea that something like a, a poppy or a cornflower, I always worry that people are getting into gardening will go and buy packets of seeds as I did when I was growing and not realize they were things that were a bit difficult that maybe needed bottom heat or stratification or just something more complicated than sow and grow but I knew that if people were going to go and take those poppy you know seed heads or cornflower seed heads that they were almost certainly going to be successful so um fingers crossed there are now around my village lots of people with uh with new Shirley poppy and cornflower plantings yeah absolutely right. that's a great combination as well Shirley poppies and cornflowers it's a real <laughs> Eye popper, lovely. Um, with with your wife getting into to sort of starting more of a cutting garden, are you letting her just get on with it when it comes to picking varieties, or are you peering over her shoulder looking at the seed catalogue, saying, "Oh, can we can we have some of that, please?" Um, it's very much her domain, to be honest, and she's probably a lot better at it than I am. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I've always have been a bit. I mean, I, I, you know, greenhouses. I love having a greenhouse. We've got we've got one 
smallish greenhouse and we're going to get another greenhouse. And I've always loved the fact that you can, it gives you so much more versatility and, and so many more options. But I grew up on a cut flower nursery in Kent. My parents had a cut flower nursery and I spent a lot of time in greenhouses when I was little, often up to no good. Um, my One of my finest, not, but finest hours was uh, as, a, as a toddler um, going down to the nursery and my father had spent a whole morning painstakingly stripping one of the heating boilers, all these big oil fired heating boilers, stripping it all down and putting all the bits on a white sheet and labeling up what everything was. And you can imagine what I did. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was, a, I was a, a, a menace to the world of greenhouses when I was that age. Um, <laughs> so I, I, like, I like having a greenhouse, but I, I'm not, I suppose I, maybe I'm not good with the fiddly work. I don't know what it is. I'm a bit fingers and thumbs really when it comes to, you know, pricking out in particular. After about 10 minutes of that, I want to go and kick a cat. Uh, <laughs> would never kick a cat, by the way. Um, uh, so, uh, so I don't, I know people, some people really love the, the, the kind of meditative, mon, you know, monotony of it, but I, I don't at all. Like, I don't get that. So Jane is much better at doing that kind of stuff. Um, there are some things that I ask, you know, I, re I request that we we have, but by and large, it's very much um, she's choosing what she wants to grow. And it's interesting because a lot of these are plants that I don't necessarily know very much about. Um, what's the one that she's very excited about? I think it's an aerogrostis called fiber optic. Have you come across yeah, that? Yeah. 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 Which, you know, is uh, very much uh, in, in vogue in the cutting garden world. And we have um, just up the road from us, we have Eastern Wall Gardens, which um, is, uh, is, has a fantastic uh, cutting garden there. And I've known Ursula. Um, oh, bees. Sorry? Sweet bees. Yeah, yeah. And, and I have to say, those, East, um, those uh, Eastern uh, Wall Garden sweet peas are really good. The colors yeah. are amazing. We, we grew quite a few this year and, and uh, the colors are wonderful. Um, so that's a great resource to have. And, and uh, you know, we've known us here for, for a long time. And uh, so, yeah, it's exciting. You know, I, I'm, I'm really I'm really interested in what, you know, what's going to happen with this cutting garden, because although I'm I'm doing the legwork on it, it I'm not leading the, 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 the process. So that's quite fun for me. We talk about Rostis, um, fiber optics there. It's one of those plants that came to us through the Dutch cut flower business really as did Ami Major, Ami Visnaga um, and all of those things and they are all plants that we can grow in the garden and interestingly enough I've been trying to get and I'm gradually getting a little bit success with this of some of the um, taller growing nerines or nerines call them what you will um, you know there's wonderful autumn flowering bulbs the Guernsey lily um, I, there's some forms of those that are much bigger and stronger growing that they grow in Holland for the cut flower market right. and there's vast greenhouses of them and um, they are perfectly hardy I think you, you probably heard of zeal giant Matthew have you yes I have yes yeah well they're derivatives of that um, okay. so they're that sort of size but slightly different in shade and paler mainly paler because zeal giant is a bit zealous shall we say in that <laughs> right yeah because it's all about stem length isn't it you've got to have that decent stem length for cutting yeah, exactly exactly but you know the cut flower market um has brought seeds to the garden for us um and and we're long we're long may it continue i think as well because you know it um, adds a new palette it adds a new shape stretch shape texture style everything else is wonderful Do you know while, yeah. while we're on this topic i think i mean i am obviously by far the newest gardener here and i often find that when i grow things i i'm very good at making little posies you know jam jar style posies but any tall vases i don't necessarily have quite the same material for them and it's possibly slightly to do with my tiny garden but alan what would you recommend for people who are new to growing cut material and they want some slightly more statuesque things that will go in a nice tall vase what would be your top recommendations larkspur uh, the annual annual delphinium if you like larkspur of any color um and i'll tell you something else that's come out of this lockdown business and i'd noticed it in the press at the weekend as well lots of people are now um saving dried flowers as well and larkspur fills both those criteria because you can pick it 
um, and gather it from the garden fresh and you can put it in a vase in the house. And I mean, it is a bit like delphiniums for people who might not know what it's like. So that will fill a large vase very easily. And then you need some, you know, your erigrostis that Matthew was mentioning a little while ago to fluff it out a bit um, and some greenery with it. Um, but you can also pick it just as it's showing its color, hang it up somewhere where it's dry. If you've got an open faced shed or something like that, or even a greenhouse, um, I prefer to keep it out of the sun so because the sun fades the colors. But if you could, if you could hang it up where it can dry, you can use it in the winter and it will last. I mean, don't do what a friend of mine did. She, she had the most beautiful arrangement at the top of her stairs on the landing windowsill and she left it there for three years. <laughs> I had the of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think with real care, um, Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, I am sure that when I took a tour around there, they said that they took the original, when they refurb, they took the original dried flowers, they put them into storage, they took all these photos and they managed to store it and bring it back. And some of the, the arrangements of dried plants there are have been there for, for probably tens of years, act, actual decades, but they're still looking good. I don't know what their secret is, but they don't look like they're covered in cobwebs. So they work their magic. Not Miss Havisham then, is it? <laughs> <laughs> now, Matthew, I think somewhere about your computer screen, you have some show and tell for us. I do. I do. I mean, it's a bit sad, really. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hello. Um, <laughs> this, um, this, this. I know it doesn't look great, does it? Wrong time of year for it. Although it should be starting to form some, some flower buds. This is Columnia crassifolia. Now I am. If anyone who listens to Gardener's Question Time will probably be aware that I, I am, to house plants what Genghis Khan was to world peace. Um, <laughs> I'm not that great, to be honest. But I do enjoy them, and this one has some emotional significance, and which is why, um, uh, although although it's shedding leaves, but don't forget, you know, even evergreens shed leaves. He says quickly, um, "This was my mum's, or rather, th this is pro the progeny of, of my mum's uh, Columnia crassifolia." Um, and we take cuttings every year from these plants, and, and got them all all around the house. And um, it's a it's a wonderful thing. It's got nice sort of glossy. Uh, green foliage, it gets darker with age, but the, the real sort of star of the show is when it flowers. It has these extraordinary, they're like orange leaping dolphins and they, they're sort of ooh, wonderful things. Uh, this sort of open tubular um, flower structure that gets wider as it gets to the mouth of the flower and then a very prominent uh, lip to the bottom of the flower. And it's just one of those plants, one of those houseplants. So sorry, I'm, I'm useless with houseplants, but this is one of those things that I will always have, partly because of the connection to my mum, but also because it's so cheerful when it's in flower. You know, a lot of houseplants tend to be, or can be, rather one-dimensional. You know, they're green and they remain green, you know, until you turn around one day, in, in the case of the sort of Monsteria deliciosa, the sweet Swiss cheese plant, which I've also got in the studio here, you know, you turn around and one day it's just taken over your entire house. Um, <laughs> but um, these are lovely because they're really easy. Put it on a, on a you know, light windowsill. Um, they don't really like being in the cold too much, so they don't put it by a drafty door. But they'll flower, it'll flower for weeks and produce these lovely, bright orange, gorgeous, lovely flowers. There we are. There we are, Mum. <laughs> for anybody wanting to buy one of those, I mean, they're not easy to find. But I think Dibleys in Wales, who are famous for the Streptocarpus, they actually have Columnia crassifolia on their list. So if anybody wants it, that's a place to look right. Good yep. tip. I was immediately thinking I'd quite like a bit of that. Um, do you remember that? Do you Obviously, it came from your mum. It's progeny of your mum's plant. But do you have a kind of visual memory of being young and those flowers? Because it seems like the kind of flower that would really capture a child's imagination. Yes, I, I mean, I have a funny feeling that I may have actually given the original plant to her as a, as a present when I was probably in single figures or, or early double figures. So I'd have been very little. Um, strangely enough, I just my sister has been looking after a whole load of stuff that included various items of my mum's and my, my father's who, who passed away, gosh, 20 years ago now. Um, and um, I... I I've just liberated these or, or rather my sister said to me come and get this stuff 
uh, I haven't got room for it anymore, which is fair enough. And, um, and I just started to go through some boxes and I found this one box that was full of um, Mother's Day cards that I'd made for her and, and Easter, Easter cards. What? Who sends an Easter card these days? <laughs> Happy Easter, mummy, I love you. You know, very sweet. <laughs> and I would imagine that I, I think I probably gave her the original plant along with one of these uh, handmade and, and, and uh, artistically interesting <laughs> um, cards uh, around about the same time. Every single one of these, these cards has got in it. I hope you like your present. I can't, I can't even begin to imagine what I would have been giving her. But I think I think I gave her the original Columbia Classifone. Yeah. At least that so plant was a good present. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, here we are now, from, from, from years later. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, yeah, still cracking on. And, and that's the lovely thing. You know, I, I know it, it, it is a cliche, but it's a, it's a truism that, you know, you can fill your garden with plants that have um associations with other people or other places and you know the garden here that i we've i've got plants that have been you know gifts from well uh tom coward the head gardener at grave tie gave me some some lovely plants they're here beth chateau gave me plants they're here some plants that alan and graham uh gave me aloe striatula oh uh, yeah 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 alan, yeah, yeah well done yep, got that here um, that was from the the desert wash at uh, um, That's right. East Rustham, uh, you know, uh, and then and then more mundane things, you know, from from my mum's garden, my dad's garden, my mother in law's garden, and it's great because you get that fabulous connection with those people. Yeah. And in fact, we've got some Japanese anemones. Uh, I don't know what it is, whether it's just a straight species or or what, no idea. That were actually planted, um, or, or actually originally belonged to. Jane's uh, great grandmother. Jane's grandmother is a hundred next year, still going strong. So that, that so that, that's going way back, you know. And that's mm. a lovely thing to have. Yeah, plants as presents sometimes um, have these wonderful associations, and sometimes they don't. I'm thinking here of something personal to me because I've got a plant um, that was given to me by. Uh, well, a friend of mine went to Madeira and brought back a seed pod, managed to raise three plants. He said, I've only got three, I'll give you one because you're more likely to take care of it than I am. So he gave it to me and I planted it in a, and repotted it and it was growing very happily and knocked it off the shelf and knocked the top of it out. And thought, oh my God, Trevor's gonna kill me now. <laughs> what have I done to his plant? Anyway, the base regrew, the, the top piece I rooted, so I had two. And this thing just kept on growing and growing and growing. And he gave it to me with the instructions that it is the most wonderful bright blue winter flowering shrub. Um, and so I've grown it for all these years and I put it in the orangery here at home the other day and it's just started to open its flower buds. Oh. And they are so mean. Oh. <laughs> this oh. thing has, it looks like a giant <laughs> nettle bush. Oh. Um, it, it's called Pycnos or Pycnostachys urticifolia comes from South Africa, right. and it has these salvia-like labiate flowers, which are the most enormous bright blue flowers, except they're not that enormous. They are if you take a close-up of them, and I took a close-up of them the other day and put it on trip, and somebody says, what is this marvellous thing? And I thought, well, it's, it's marvellous until you actually see it on, on the bush, and it's not that marvellous. Mm. <laughs> but it's interesting to have, and I mean, you know, I shall always remember Trevor for that, whether I keep it or not, I don't know, because it's quite big and it takes up an awful lot of space. I threw it out of the orangery and we haven't had any frost here, so it's standing outside and it's blooming happily away outside the cart shed. So, um, well, we'll see what happens. Yes, exactly. Yes, it's going to prove itself for a, a East Anglian winter, otherwise it's... A little gone. time, Matthew, it will die. <laughs> It's funny this idea of of uh, kind of getting inspired by other people's uh, you know plants you've been given seeds you've been given very much brings me on to FOMO. So FOMO, a kind of plant based FOMO, the the plants you see in other people's gardens or on a television program, in the magazine, Instagram, wherever it might be, and you just desperately want to grow it. Well, it's funny because this this is all this is like a whole long backstory that goes back to Alan because Alan has this amazing tropiolum growing at East Ruston, Smithy Eye, gorgeous little flowers and it's really vigorous. And when we were filming some of the videos at East Ruston, you gave me a handful of seed to bring back yeah. and I mm. managed to germinate them, but I was worried about um, my claggy clay soil and winter and everything. So I left some outside, I brought one indoors 
and the one that I brought indoors is doing very well but obviously it's it's indoors and it's a vigorous climbing plant so it's currently trying to sort of climb its way up my uh, my window but that's the beginning of the story then last week you started talking about double flowered nasturtiums things like Man, the grass off yeah. and this this double cream one that you desperately want to find so I've sort of been googling around tropiolums and I've discovered pentaphyllum yeah. which I can't find anywhere to actually buy the seed of You don't need to, you just ask me, don't you? I've told <laughs> you this. How many times do I tell you this on a weekly basis? <laughs> I have pots of it. <laughs> but this, this tropiolum, I don't know how I'm not aware of it already, because clearly you have it in your garden, but these fabulous little flared tubular flowers. Um, Pink and green, yeah. Exact pink and green, and yeah. um, and do they have some sort of little freckling in the inside? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. They're one of those. They're one of those plants that I mean, they don't scream attention. And perhaps you, you know, uh, lots of people would never see it. They'd miss it completely. But it's one of those plants that you put at the back of a border, preferably somewhere fairly sheltered. So I've got mine at the, at the bottom of a south facing wall and it scrambles up through roses and goodness knows what else there is growing there. And you suddenly see it, it can be above head height. Um, and this delicate little thing with these wiry stems. And then suddenly in May and June, I suppose it's about its best time. It has these lovely green and pink speckly flowers. It's just a charmer. Yeah, well- it's Easy to grow. <clears throat> Next time I'm at East Ruston. <laughs> <laughs> it's got your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> my filter one. So that's my Flomo, um, an Alan Gray based Flomo. Um, Matthew, what would you like to grow? What's your Flomo? Oh, I mean, it's pro probably um, probably have to do another five or six of these. <laughs> um, I do remember, um, you know, Beth Chatto making another appearance in this in this podcast, and why not? I do remember her. Uh, sharing a, a story with me about how um, George Smith, the florist, who had yes. a wonderful garden uh, just outside York, and um, ha having a conversation, she was having a conversation with him. He was uh, visiting her garden and was admiring the the, um, the the almost blindingly silver foliage of things like you know Artemisia arborescens, and, and which you know in a, in a hot, dry East Anglia really kind of come out and even here in, in Rutland we're only 30 miles here if I get in a car and drive uh, due east we're, we're into East Anglia so not that far away from East Anglia here um, and he was admiring those and, and, and uh, you know bemoaning the fact that he couldn't grow them and, and uh, they said to him but I can't grow flocks you, you grow flocks you know you grow flocks brilliantly and, and I'm terribly envious of your flocks and you know that of course formed the whole basis of, of her thinking about you know, growing, which was very much right plant for the right place. Having said that, um, it would be nice. They wouldn't look right here, but it would be lovely to be able to grow Himalayan blue poppies. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> that would be that would be great. And I about four years ago, I think it probably was now. Um, I went up to the, this garden in the borders, the name of which escapes me, which is really annoying. Maybe it will pop into my head at some point. Um, to do a little film for Gardener's World, and, and um, there was a this dell. Um, it was a, a Himalayan garden, and uh, it was an interesting garden because it was genuinely Himalayan. Because the 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 chap who'd done all the work was actually a Sherpa, um, a, ne a Nepalese Sherpa, who'd met the owner um, and actually saved her life as she she was risk of being swept away in a in a, in a in a flood. It was quite an extraordinary backstory, and so. He'd ended up moving over with his wife and children, and together with uh, Judith, the owner, they'd made this garden. It, if I can't think of the name of it, uh, for this, I'll uh, I, you can put it in a in a link later on. <laughs> anyway, I remember sitting down in this dell, uh, chatting to this wonderful uh, Nepalese Sherpa about the development of the garden, and, and um, surrounded by all these unbelievably iridescent blue. Mechanopsis, and they weren't. It wasn't. They weren't just single variety. There was Sheldonia grandis. There was all sorts of interesting crosses, and some were the pure, you know, very very light, almost baby blue, uh, uh, um, and some were had this sort of purpley iridescence to the to the uh, petals, and it was just crazy. It was just completely overwhelmed by them, and. I will never ever forget that, nor will I forget being eaten alive by midges at the same time. <laughs> I mean, 
in every orifice. I mean, just <laughs> so it's this moment of extreme wonderful beauty, um, but also great discomfort, and at the same time trying not to look as if I was being eaten alive for the cameras. <laughs> see, every, 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 every tale has a payback story, doesn't it? I mean, I'm. Oh. Do you remember Mike Wickenden, who used to have the Cully Gardens at the Gatehouse Fleet um, yeah. in Scotland? Well, him and I used to converse quite regularly, and we always said that it was it was kind of crazy that he wanted to, in the in the moistness of of, of the Gatehouse of Fleet in Scotland, wanted to grow um, cistus and all of those things. Well, I mean, it's, it's almost it's not impossible, but I mean, it's hard. I wanted to grow blue poppies down here in dry old East Anglia, and it's hard. And still I persist um, in doing... Those are quite good, though. Well, they're not bad, but they're not good. They're not, as Matthew has just described, I mean, my, I sat here drooling <laughs> while he's sitting in this dell with all these wonderful, <laughs> huge blue poppies. Um, but my Flomo is a poppy, believe it or not, going back to that, because last year I had a Flomo and it was Beth's pink poppy to bring Beth Chatter back into the conversation, <laughs> um, which they use widely at Great Dixter. Fergus Garrett had used it there as a, as a, as a sprinkling through um, early summer borders, and I wanted that very badly. And so I got the seed and I've got that. Now, my Flomo for this year is a poppy and it's nothing to do with me whatsoever, but it is called Amazing Grey. <laughs> because it has these grey flowers. Now, whether I'm going to actually like it or not, I don't know, because it takes some kind of imagining, doesn't it? But I think possibly um, if I think about it with grey, with whites, with pale pinks, ethereal kind of colours, it might work. Um, we'll see anyway. I've got the seeds waiting and I'm going to sow them soon. Mm. But poppy, uh, an annual poppy called Amazing Grey. Which I told I literally... you that, I've got the seed and I don't want it to sell out. So <laughs> if anybody wants it, I think you better get on the list and get, get, get it straight away because I think it's going to be very popular. Well, I just literally, I think two days ago, pressed buy on a seed list that included Papa Amazing Grey. <laughs> I know where you got it from. Yeah. <laughs> the old Chilton seeds. <laughs> yeah, that and a whole load of other things that I definitely don't have room to grow, but when did that ever stop a gardener, hey? <laughs> Um, I thought is you should have a, a kind of reverse FOMO where, where it's, you know, plants you really can't bear and wouldn't be within six inches, six, six miles of. Uh, yeah, I got, I got in terrible trouble for dissing heucheras. I think that the, the, the issue that I was trying to um, tactfully, but obviously failing horribly to, to raise is that, you know, I remember growing things that, um, like there was a, there's a heuchera, I don't even know if it's still in cultivation, called Firefly. Mm. And it was beautiful. It had these lovely little um, dancing pink, you know, luminous flowers, almost fluorescent flowers, and it just green foliage. Yeah. Now, of course, what we, what we have is is ones that look like somebody's dropped their custard on the floor, <laughs> and they have these 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 flowers that are the colour of a, a pair of pants washed with a dark sock. And I, I you know. And this, again, I'm, I'm failing to deliver it this tactfully, aren't I? <laughs> it's not doing well at all. No, Matthew, you're not doing it tactfully, but you're putting it perfectly because you're saying really, well, I think what we all think, um, and you know, some of these things can get uh, to the stage where plant breeders just go mad and they get another and another and another. And it does become, I mean, the same thing happened with Virginia's years and years ago. I think there were just yeah. too many of them. Um, yeah. And there are, some, there are some good plants in both uh, Eucharis and, and in Virginia, one of my favorite heucheras is a, a variety called Paris. And Paris has green foliage, as you say, but it has the most delightful, bright coral red flowers. And I just love it for that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not a showy plant. It's not huge, big, blousy flowers or anything else, but I mean, it, it's just a lovely thing. And of course, everybody's gonna get their payback because heucheras are beloved by those horrible little beetles, you know, the- well, the Vine weevils. That's it, the vine weevil. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Favorite it's interesting isn't it I think so often the plants that we dislike are it's because of association I mean Alan and I have talked so much in the past about uh, municipal planting and the the things that there's actually nothing wrong with them but you've just seen yeah. them too often in a car park uh, to want them in your garden and then I think sometimes plants become popular and they just get planted badly or, or put into the wrong planting scheme and I cannot for the life of me remember the name of it the black grass that isn't a grass 
Oh, a fire Bogan. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just, I've seen it planted, uh, probably only twice in my life have I seen it planted in a way that made me think, oh yeah, that really works. It's just all over the place, planted in a way that really doesn't show off. So I've now developed quite a, a sort of bad association with that and wouldn't dream of planting it. And yet I know it probably could work really well. Christopher Lloyd planted it and he used it as a background planting to um, two bulbs. Um, the first of all, the, <coughs> and, and he used um, a, a a low sedum for this as well, but um, for growing alliums through, which worked really, really well for early in su early summer, and then for nerines later on in the year. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you've got this black background with this lovely, I mean, I'm not saying it looks wonderful the whole time, but my absolute hate, one of my absolute hates was shrubby potentillas. And again, because they've been used as, as supermarket car park plants, they'd been around the Norwich City football ground, not going to go there that much, but um, <laughs> it, it, it was enough to put me off until I went to Newby Hall. Um, and have you been to Newby Hall, Matthew? Yes, I have, yeah, many Fantastic times. Fantastic garden, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and there I saw a planting with a, um, a, a lemony yellow shrubby potentilla with a calamitous heraclifolia. And I, I don't know what the what the clematis variety name was, but I mean, it's a shrubby clematis and the yellow and the blue flowers together in the autumn were absolutely fantastic. And I've, I've, I've emulated it. I mean, I've, I've copied the planting and put it in the garden here. It was so nice. Yeah. It's funny. I have a very similar association with those sorts of potentillas. Um, but I, because my other half isn't a gardener, any time he's drawn to a plant, I pretty much will buy it and put it in so that he's had some input into the garden. And just unfortunately, one of the things he picked was exactly that, the kind of shrubby yellow potentilla. But mm. um, it ended up being planted next to a royal bumble salvia. And the, the kind of the cheeriness of the red and the yellow together actually ended up being really one of the nicest combinations in the garden. So I'm glad I did it. Well, now, if you say that to some people, they say, oh, no, you can't possibly put red and yellow together. They will never work. But they've forgotten the one thing. There's two words, tonal quality. <laughs> and it depends on the tone of the yellow and the tone of the red and so on and so forth, whether the red's got orange in it or pink in it. Um, so much depends on, on how the, how the colours how colors work together. And I think tonal quality is very important. Hmm. And also, of course, the overwhelming colour in that combination is still going to be green. Yeah. 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 It, it, you know, it's not as if it's a solid. It's not as if you're wearing a, you know, a, a yellow jumper over a, you know, whatever. <laughs> and and as Rosie Hardy pointed out on this podcast, uh, yellow does do amazing things to bring out the the kind of qualities in other flowers. Um, so you know, a bit of yellow never hurt anybody. Yeah, I mean, I think I probably I still I still feel a little bit queasy when forsythias are in full go, especially when they're. Well, there is another. There's a very nice pale yellow forsythia, the name of which escapes me. is more of a primrosey colour, but that really yeah, brassy. Yeah. Do you know the one I mean, Alan? I, I do. It's it's. Um, I can't think of the name of it either. I, I I was digging plants a bit up the other day because it's a very scandent shrub, um, and it um, it kind of creeps along the ground and roots where it, where it, and I was digging some of those rooted cuttings up the other day. Um, oh gosh, whatever's its name, <laughs> never mind. But it has lemon yellow flowers and the bells on a, a space further apart along the stems. I mean, if we get varieties of Forsythia intermedia, they can be pretty um, overwhelming, shall we say. You see them in every front garden in the, in, when you're driving through suburbia and they're probably partnered by a bright pink cherry, which does neither of them any good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not doing each other any favours. Um, but the, 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 the Forsythia that you're talking about is a, is a shrub to be, to be used. And I've actually devised a use for it because it is so floppy and scandent. It really needs tying to a wall or a fence or a support. And I'm going to try growing this together with a salvia that came from York Gate. Um, and I want to make a pyramid, a, a fairly permanent pyramid of um, st stout stems and grow the forsythia up through it. So it flows over at the top like a fountain and it can come out through the sides as well on the way up. So it will make like a waterfall of, of yellow. And then the salvia I want to grow through it as well is called sal salvia atrocyania, which is a very tall two meters plus salvia and the long stems of blue flowers from bright green calyxes, and there's a little bit of black in the calyx as well, they, they emerge and they coil like Medusa serpents on the on edge, you know, <laughs> and it just, it's a fantastic thing. And I just thought the two of them together, one early, one late, that might make an interesting pairing. Yeah, sounds great. Wow. Mm. 
Well, we've gone full circle from Flomo to anti Flomo and back to Flomo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Matthew, thank you very much for coming and joining us for a spot of Talking Dirty. Will you come back again one day? Oh, you, absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, maybe when my calumny is in flower. Yes, please. <laughs> well, yes, good luck good. with 2021 and your kitchen garden project and everything else. Thank you. See you Happy again. gardening in 2021, everyone. Bye-bye. Happy gardening. Bye. Oh, you are a handsome devil, aren't you? Look at that smiley face. Oh, look at you. <laughs> Also, weights room and gym. I mean, oh wow! Sort of, there, there you go. There's my there's there's the weights rack. You know, it's all <laughs> it's all going on. Are you happy to share your middle name? Yeah, I don't have one. So <laughs> my parents just had no imagination. I might do a show and tell on my Columnia crassifolia because it's from my it's my my it's talking about my mum and it's one of my mum's plants and I've abused this poor thing. Look at it. Oh. <laughs> It has those fantastic flowers that look like psychedelic dolphins.